Hello, today I am joined by Professor Alexander Arguelles, who's been a friend of mine for a long time now, ever since we met over the forum, How to Learn Any Language. And we were friends from the polyglot section of that forum. So it's been many years and I remember lots and lots of conversations uh, about the forum and sort of where you had visions of, of having polyglottery as a thing that we actually study mm -hmm. and not just as a, something that happens having studied lots of languages but that actually in and of itself as a, as a, as a study thing mm -hmm. and you talked many years ago about the idea of an academy and many people have asked me about the academy and what happened and what your thoughts were and ideas were and I just love to hear from you about where they were then and maybe where they're progressing now. Well, I guess what I always thought is I, I felt like I myself made a lot of wrong turns. I wasted a lot with hindsight. I wasted a lot of time. I did things that like if I had proceeded more systematically, if I hadn't stopped and started some languages, if I'd done other languages before, if I learned some techniques better, it just occurred to me that you know, I could have been more advanced, more where I wanted to be in other languages, you know, than faster than I did. And I just thought, you know, it's a shame to let everybody stumble through that whole process. If we could take our experience and, and give that to the benefit of others so that, you know, people who get this, this bug that we have to learn lots of languages when they're younger so that they could um, do it, you know, with, with more effectively, you know, faster, that would be better for them and then they could do more with, with their languages and so it would just you know behoove them so I had the idea I remember a long time ago of sort of systematic training in polyglottery a way of you know getting the foundational languages I remember thinking you know so much of our vocabulary in the world languages comes from just a few source languages mm -hmm. classical Chinese Sanskrit Arabic Latin and Greek. So if people knew these languages, then it makes it so much easier to learn others. So it seemed, you know, just a systematic way of training and learning them. So um, I always liked the idea of doing that. I still like the idea of, of, of doing that. Um, but basically, I always thought that it had to be a physical venue. I always thought, you know, this must be, you know, some, you know, I have to, you know, actually physically interact with people. I have to be somewhere. And I, it's really hard to get any um, academic or institution to back such an idea or do something with that. And so people encouraged me. I remember way back in 2008, uh, talking with Harold Goodman, and he said, you can do this virtually. And I just thought, well, thanks for the encouragement, but I just, I couldn't wrap my head around it. I, I just, for the longest time, you're so much more advanced than I am in everything with social and digital and stuff like that. Maybe other people got there before I did, but I just could not wrap my head around doing anything virtually until quite recently. I mean, even when I was in Dubai, the American University in Dubai, the administration there tried to kind of almost strong arm us into developing a hybrid model of developing one online class a, a month and having the others be available for people who wanted it. And it wasn't just I, it was the people in the computer science department. Nobody liked that. It just And this was just like, I don't know, four or five years ago. Um, it just didn't seem like it was there, but it wasn't until recently, you know, in the, in the COVID lockdowns, when it was do or die with developing um, sort of Zoom classroom type things, mm -hmm. that I got an experience of that. And it was like, hey, well, we kind of went into this because we it was duress to do this or do nothing. But actually, it really, really worked really, really well. Um, I was I was amazingly happily surprised at how well these sort of Zoom, Zoom classes, Zoom circles work. And so this has given me the confidence that this is something that um, something we can do um, virtually. And so I guess I kind of think of the, the plan that I have now is I still love the idea of having enough people who are there who want to do something in you know, systematic you know, for learning polyglottery. But I, I think that if this is to be in an organization, an institution, an academy, it needs to have a <clears throat> kind of a solid foundation in some basic courses that, you know, that, you know, there's enough people coming to do some sort of, I don't want to call it standard things, but, you know, to, to the rest of the world, it's comprehensible to come in and, and improve your French or to study German literature is much more understandable than going to get a systematic training in polyglottery. But if we have enough 
if it's got a foundation in, in developing, you know, regular classes like that, then that'll give it, you know, the, the base that it needs to then develop and offer more of the, the original idea. And then some people listening to this will remember the uh, videos that you started creating way back when. I mean, YouTube was in its infancy and you've created some really iconic videos in the language learning space on evaluating courses, your shadowing method and how you use that for language learning. And it's referred to again and again in conversations I have online with people. Mm -hmm. and people often refer to that as well, even in presentations and, and different places. So, I mean, you were doing that back then. So I suppose it would be a bit of a surprise for people to hear you saying this about technology, given that you were online and it's not like you were completely out of nowhere, you know, to where you are mm -hmm. now. And now you've mm -hmm. started that process again and showing people how you learn online and how people can can start learning themselves absolutely and, yeah and and this has been a lifelong thing for you right so i mean mm -hmm. just talk me through as well because I, I mean i i know more about you i suppose through lots of conversations and through presentations but sort of your own lifelong learning has taken different formats and different styles i guess as well hasn't it over mm -hmm. the years it has, and that's, you know, it, I, I just do see, you know, lifelong learning is, you know, if you're, if you're in traditional academia, if you're in the, in the school of, it's such a buzzword. I mean, people talk about it all the time, but what does it really mean? Where do you really see it? How do you really do it? You know, to what degree, you know, do you, do you get, I mean, we got a college president at the beginning of every new school year will tell the students, you know, we're here to give you lifelong learning, but how, how do you access that? How do you do that? And yeah, I mean, my quest for lifelong learning has, has taken me around the world. I mean, that's why I've had an international career. That's why I've lived in different places and, and you know, gone there to, to learn the languages. And then once I learn the languages to really delve into the cultures by reading, you know, reading and thinking about the, the cultural products, the literature of them. So, you know, I've pursued it that way. But I, I do think now that, again, this, uh, you're right. I mean, I, I've been, you know, I'm not, a total technophobe. I'm not, you know, totally averse to using any kind of technology. It's just that, you know, there's there there are degrees of it, and and people like you are just far ahead of me in in that regard. I mean, I can do a few things, but um, yeah, just just the basic idea of it, conducting an educational um, program uh, without having actual physical contact. That's what I couldn't wrap my head around now. But now that I have, and I see that. You know, in point of fact, it actually, the, the educational part, the intensive immersion part can actually work better on, you know, through distance learning than, than by in-person because when people are in person, then they, you know, between classes, between segments, they'll just like revert to English, hanging out with the cell, they're doing things, you know, whereas when they're, you know, in a Zoom class or a Zoom circle environment, then that's all they have is to, to use the language and, and, and interact with it. Um, so, but, but when I say, uh, lifelong learning now, I really do feel like this revolution, as it were, this, this uh, educational revolution of being able to have these classrooms has, in my mind, conceptually um, freed me from the idea that I have to be tied to some larger institution to, to give me support. And also, I think it's freed me from the idea that until now, the only people that could study with me were people that happened to be enrolled at a particular program or a particular institution where I happened to be. And so you're right, I, I, I feel a, a calling, a duty, a responsibility to share my knowledge and experience with the wider world. And, you know, I've tried to do that through the forum and through videos and stuff like that. But um, as you know, I kind of like stop and start because when I carry myself around the world, I get to a new place and I'm, it's, I'm overwhelmed with new duties, new responsibilities, and just get caught up in that. So um, now, if I can have my own sort of program, my own academy virtual thing going, then I won't have to do that anymore. And I'll be able to continue um, providing this kind of knowledge, this kind of experience in, in these formats, uh, you know, forum-like and, and, and YouTube video-like and things like that too. But I also think that <clears throat> um, on the flip side, it also, because of what I just said, now people from all over the world, not who are in a specific program, um, can also avail themselves of educational opportunities like the, the ones that I'm hoping to, to offer. And that makes me really think that, yeah, this idea of lifelong learning is 
is has really arrived because until now, if you wanted to learn something from somebody, again, you had to go to that institution where that person was and do something. And now it doesn't have to be that way. And so I really feel like um, one of the, I don't know that there's been any way around it until now. I mean, education was something basically that you did when you were young. You were in school, you got educated, and then you left school and you went out into the world and did other things. But it, that's not really what education is ever can, can be. I mean, you, you should keep learning throughout your life, lifelong learning, uh, and you learn more when you get older and different experiences and you go back and you see things. So I think that really lifelong learning has kind of, kind of arrived now with these sort of Zoom classroom type opportunities. People can throughout their, um, throughout, throughout the ages participate in sort of learning circles and opportunities. Yeah, I, I, I love how you described it. And I've, I, it reminds me actually just hearing you talking about lifelong learning and about the things that you've been doing and also having visited you two years ago, just before um, all of these lockdowns started. Mm -hmm. A few things happened during that time. First of all, I mean, uh, when the lockdown started, I realized that things were going online and I took advantage myself of opportunities that were just not available, uh, learning languages and studying courses that I would have had to have gone to to quite remote destinations to be able to access that information and those teachers. And so when we met in, uh, in Minnesota and I went to Concordia uh, to, to do a, give a, have a tour of the, of the school and what you do, and we talked a lot about the kinds of courses and things that you were working on. One of the things that you told me about was sort of looking at literature as well when you went online and carrying that that on um, in the online environment and when you mentioned that to me it sort of brought back memories of other conversations we'd had where you said the beautiful thing about literature particularly Persian literature which I know you were a huge fan of and um, probably still are, are to this day was how there was an awakening of a past culture and an entire world that's no longer accessible, even if you travel. And this is what literature gave you uh, in your language learning journey. And just talk to me a little bit about how you use literature now with, with students and where you see that in terms of language learning experience. Well, exactly what you just said. I mean, I've always seen literature as being the the way that a culture, I mean, it's through individuals who are from a culture, but you know, they come from a particular place and a particular background. And, you know, it's, we love language and people who write what we call literature take extra care with language. I mean, they spend extra time choosing the right words and getting the right phrases and building the right images and, you know, capturing things of value that, that come from their culture. So, um, yeah, I've always talked about the diachronic aspect, the cross cross-temporal aspect of, of language learning for me is really important. I mean, it's nice to be able to talk to people today, but by, you know, reading literature that was written 100 or 500 years ago, you're sort of having a conversation with one side, or at least, you know, listening to somebody from, from a different time and a different place and understanding them. Um, and I think, it'll, I do think, you know, a fair number of people, you know, can and do appreciate this and that, that it's valuable in and of itself. But also, as we've talked about, and I've given a couple of talks, I think it was in Novi Sad about, you know, literature really is, even if you're not so gung-ho about reading and getting into the culture, it's the, the vocabulary range that you get from reading is, you know, is, is wider than the vocabulary range you can get from just conversation. Um, and so people, if you want to sort of go from being intermediate to advanced, I think basically, I mean, if you don't have the opportunity to go and do an immersion, stay in a country for a protracted period I mean, that's one way you can go just really go and live the language but if you you know you're unable to to do that um i think reading literature is kind of the best bridge that you can take to get yourself from going to intermediate to advanced and it's also in my experience kind of one of the hardest things to do i mean if people um you can as we well know i mean it's possible to teach yourself a language to a certain degree, and then you need to sort of get a helping hand, either go to the country or, or, or do something, you know, read and starting to read, you know, really getting into, particularly if it's a different kind of literature, a different kind of script, a different mindset, like Persian or Russian, um, is, is quite a difficult task. And it can be daunting when you feel like, oh, I studied well, I'm ready for it. And then you try to start reading. And it's like, oh, this is much harder than I thought. I guess I better go study some more. So it's, it's hard to like make that bridge. Um, but I do think that that's, again, that's why I want to offer the kind of courses that I do, because I think that 
um, this is where I can most help people with, with that helping hand now. It's just, okay, if I'm there to sort of guide you into reading, help you with the, the background, the context, the vocabulary, the imagery, tying the threads together, um, I think that can help people get to, get to a higher level. So to me, it's sort of a, a doorway to the culture, a doorway to the, the, the history of the culture, and a doorway to higher levels in the language. So the courses that you you offer and you're going to be offering uh, in the future are very much uh, tied to this passion for for literature and this this insight that you have, especially having s sampled and you've really been into and under the skin of so many world literatures. I suppose you know that that experience is is something you can take to offer to more people. I th I think so. I mean, and and just to go, you know. To, to, to go back, I mean, that's also where I have the most, the most, the most background, the most professional training. That's where my degrees are, you know, that's, you know, I'm, I'm trained in that, I've got experience in that, and that's where I'm really qualified to, to do. And it's also, but it's, you know, that's my passion. That's why, that's why I went into that. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's very much true. And I've always felt like, you know, I just, comparative literature is nice. I love reading different places, different times, and, uh, and just doing all of that. So just, uh, the whole idea of helping people um, to learn how to read not just one different literature, but multiple different literatures. It's kind of exciting. So in this form that I, I showed you, where I asked people to say what they want, I was very happy to see lots of people saying, yeah, I want this, 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 and that. You know, they want to do three or four different languages, not just one. So that to me is like the heart of polyglottery, polyliteracy is not just focusing on, on getting advanced and doing one language, but doing multiple ones. So it's very gratifying that we're able to help people do that. And of course, I'll put a link to the, the form for anyone who's interested to work with you on their language development uh, so that they can reach out as well and, and see what opportunities there are to, to work with you on deepening their linguistic ability. And um, Thank you. just to sort of reiterate sort of what it is you do, but also what it is you're not doing. So I think it's important to sort of to, to really set the you know, the, the idea in people's heads as to what, what they're getting from you and what, mm -hmm. what this is not as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, well, again, I've gotten a lot of inquiries, like won't I have some classes, some beginner classes and things like that. And basically, you know, I know because I, I think that there's enough information out there, enough knowledge, it's better to teach yourself a language. I think that, you know, that's what people like you and I have been, that's our message for the past 20 years is that it's, it's probably more effective and more efficient to teach yourself a language. And there's so many resources, so many things out there to help you do that now that um, it doesn't, you know, I, I would much rather spend my time and like I said, I, I know that that jump from bridge from intermediate to advanced to really becoming able to read independently, that's a really hard step and that's where you need help. So I'm happy to, to give it, I'm happy to give advice like I always have and how to, you know, effective ways in teaching yourself a language and doing things. And um, on this form, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, looking for people to say other things that they want. And if there's a large call for something else that I realize I can do, I'm happy to provide that as well. I already do have planned what um, I should, you can help me come up with the best name of it. It's like a, sort of a, a group, a support group, a, a, a train, you know, a training thing. So if, you, if you're teaching yourself a language and you want to actually like, okay, let's have some structure. Let's make sure I stick to it. Let's make sure I have constant resources with the best techniques and can talk to somebody, you know, I'll have a weekly meeting with a group of people who are teaching themselves languages. So giving advice, problem solving advice, techniques, methodologies, you know, consult, you know sort of a group consultation. What's, what, how should you structure your studies? What should you do next? Um, I'm always happy to help people with that. Um, I'm always happy to um, take, you know, requests for consultation and advice. That's a new a feature that my, my site will have too, like in the old forum where you and I met when people would write to me, what should my five-year study plan be? What should I, you know, I want to learn all these languages. Is there a sequence in which I should learn them? So I'll have a, a question and answer page where people can ask things like that and try to have that be um, available, resourced as an index so people can find that. So I'm happy to give advice, but in terms of actually just spending time teaching basic language skills, I think that, that again, that's something that people, that's, that's been my message all along. Be an autodidactic person, learn by yourself, teach yourself. And then when you have gotten a solid foundation and you need help going to the next step, then reach out, go for, a, go for an immersion, stay in a country, come for a literature class, do something like that. Okay. 
I think that gives us a really good uh, idea of what people can expect. And um, definitely, I mean, um, I, I've been running some sessions myself to to help people, and um, I've actually named the the group ones where people ask me questions like that on learning styles and techniques and things to do uh, language learning therapy sessions. So <laughs> it's a safe space for people to explore and to ask questions. Right. Nothing's at, you know nothing's off the table almost. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that kind of thing is 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 really useful as well. So I'm glad you're you're including that as well I think mm -hmm. um if I'm honest I think it's a really great opportunity for anyone to study with you um mm -hmm. you've you're passionate about the subject you've got so much knowledge and experience and um linguistically as well I mean your your knowledge is just uh, incredible so uh, having had the pleasure of spending many weeks with you now over the years uh where we've got to speak to each other at length uh, about our linguistic journeys. I, We've uh, roamed through St. Petersburg, Russia, Bermidji, Minnesota, Reykjavik, Iceland, Fukuoka, Japan. Fukuoka, Japan. <laughs> We've we <laughs> been to quite a lot of places together. <laughs> Over the years, it's really started to add up, right? And yeah. and I I just think that anyone who you know who's interested and wants to really get under the skin of you know how you learn and and getting that one-on-one -on -one consultation um or even in a group the, that special attention sometimes is really important um it can just be the difference of keeping the motivation going and not and and so i would really encourage uh, you to check out the link below uh, where you can sign up to show your interest in working uh, with alexander and um and then we'll also link to the website and uh, We'll get everything uh, that you need prepared, and I'll also link to all of Alexander's um, uh, pages. So not just the website, but also YouTube channel, which you probably have found before you found me, because he's much more popular and uh, much more dashing than I am. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Is there anything else you would like to add before we wrap up? There is one other thing that I already did put on there. It's it's what we call great books education, where we're talking about the idea of cultures. This would be again. I, I, I'm trying to offer it in all the languages, so reading you know the original works in German or French as well. But there is a collection called the Great Books of the Western World that is in America forms the basis of core curriculum in college, and it's sort of the idea of it goes back to that lifelong learning, the seminar type, you know. I don't have the answers. I can't explain exactly what Karl Marx is saying or what, you know, or, or what Hegel or what Aristotle is saying, but books like that, you're not supposed to like read for information or fun. You're supposed to, just supposed to challenge your mind. You're supposed to read them and say to other people, what do you think? How do you think about them? So I'm also having that. That's another part of, of my whole education. My whole training is to have that kind of thing. So um, that's something that might interest people too. Great books, education, meaning classics, the, the canon, the tradition of, of, of works that are called the great conversation, you know, like what I mentioned before, somebody 500 years ago says something, you can't, he can't hear you talk back to him, but if you base your thoughts based upon the kind of ideas that he had, that's there too, so um, that's also very integral to, to what I'm doing. I'd love to have this uh, ultimately be in, in the widest variety of all possible languages. That was always a feature of my my old website, and it will be on this one too, great books lists, are sort of the, the classic works that you might want to read, not just from Western civilization, but from Indic civilization, East Asian civilization, Islamic civilization. So that's going to be there too. Brilliant. Thank you so, so much for your time. And well, thank you. All the very best for this uh, endeavor. And um, okay. I'm sure lots of very excited people will be busy clicking on that link and thank you, Richard. reaching out. So, uh, Take care and I will okay. see you then. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.